So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming here at this ungodly hour at 9 o'clock. Um, what I'm speaking about today is the Codeface project, which is driven by Siemens Corporate Technology. So, I work for Siemens for their Corporate Research and Technology Center. And contrary to what you may think or may have heard about Siemens, we are a very big software company. So, we have like 35,000 engineers who are busy developing software. That's more than Microsoft and Google put together. But um, that aspect of Siemens does not very often reach the general public, so I'm always happy to outline it in the beginning of my talks. And what you may also find astonishing, we do have a corporate competence center for embedded Linux, which consists about like 15 people, consists of about like 15 people, and deals with all the issues um, that come with um, working with open source software, contributing to open source software, and so on. This is work done um, jointly with the Technical University of Regensburg and the University of Passau, two German universities, um, whose support is very much acknowledged. And actually, I need to acknowledge a second thing, namely Tim Bird's keynote. Thank you very much. You've set the stage perfectly for my talk, because what I'm going to speak about is what's open source software about. Naturally, it's about publishing code, but as Tim mentioned in his keynote, the more important thing is the network effect. So you do not just dump code outside to the public, but you really want to build communities, you want, to, want people to cooperate on the software, and you want to leverage these network effects. And this is precisely what the code phase project is about. So we all agree that there are networking effects when you publish code and then people work together on the code. That's nice, but uh, obviously it's not as simple as that. So there surely are different types of networks, there are different projects that have different governance styles, different styles of people working together. So the question is, what different types are there? Surely networking effects are not just unconditional goodness, there are good aspects to it and bad aspects to it. So how do we distinguish between good and bad approaches and the good and bad things that come with them. Software is a lot about people, but it's not just about people, it's still also a bit about technology. So how does the actual technology impact the networking effects? And finally, in the end of the day, the reason why we are doing this um, open source thing is we want to create better software in the end of the day. And um, we've been doing research into the question how can these networking effects, these social effects, these community effects help to build better software in the end of the day? So that's my outline. Why are we doing this? Obviously, when you're a company that produces uh, products that rely on open source software, you want to understand the embedded software ecosystem as good as possible. You usually work with lots of projects, 20, 30, maybe 50 projects in a product, so you cannot be an expert in all of them. Either you can rely on external guidance by people who know, or you need to find some automated or semi-automated means to make these decisions, and that's actually what we're trying to do with the Codeface project. You can also think about how to get properly involved in the project, so where does a project need my help? In what areas does a project need my help? You need to decide where to spend. You're always invariably finite funds. We're trying to help here. It may also be interesting when you run your own open source projects because Codeface allows you to do yeah, something that goes in the area of software con or project controlling so you can compare how does my software project do uh, in relation to others which I know are good and that I can learn from. And learning is also one of the crucial um, aspects of this effort as a software development company we are more than happy to learn from the masters. And as all of you know, the masters are to be found in open source software development. Good. So when we're doing software development, actually things are very simple because in my opinion, there are only two main problems um, that come with software development. So let me introduce you to these two problems. Problem number one, so obviously software development is about technology. And technology has been plaguing us for the last couple of thousands of years, maybe starting with this um, failed technological project of building the first multi-story building in ancient Babel. And since then, people have had various problems 
with technology. So that's one area that directly hits software development that needs to be solved. The second problem that comes with software development, and that is, in my opinion, the more interesting problem is it's about people. And more so than technology, people do come in various shapes, sizes, opinions. And even if you have the perfect technology for a given undertaking at hand, you're still not guaranteed that your efforts will lead to fruition because of the people involved in these projects and the effects that come from the people. So in Codeface, we're trying to understand these two aspects of software development technology on the one hand and people on the other hand. Now, why is that such an issue in software development? Because um, essentially, software development is an engineering thing. And one could assume, and people often do assume, you go to school, you go to grad school, you go to university, you're taught to be a programmer, and then um, yeah, your company just tells you, do the software project, engineers go work uh, on the project, and then it succeeds. But obviously, most of the time it doesn't, so why is that with software development? And that is because software development is a very peculiar thing. If you compare it to, say, um, things like pharmaceuticals, when you take drugs, when you have some illness and you're offered red pills, blue pills, multicolored pills, you surely won't say, hey, I'm going to take the blue ones and see how they work. If they work, if not, I'm going to take the red ones. Maybe these work. I don't care for the, uh, for the side effects of any undesired effects. And why you are able to not do that is because designing drugs is very well understood in two aspects. So there's a big a priori understanding of how the body works, how drugs works, how drugs work, and you know the chemistry, so you can design drugs that really fulfill the need you have. And uh, despite this a priori understanding, um, the pharmaceutical industry uses a lot of tests and statistical reasoning to check whether the products are safe or not. When you do compare that to software development, you see that you only rarely have the opportunity to do comparative experiments. So when you develop a big piece of software, you usually don't have the funds to do it twice just to check different styles of governance or different styles of cooperation. It's also a problem about the people involved, as I mentioned in the beginning, because it's very hard to quantify people and their behavior. It's much easier to quantify chemical compounds and their behavior. And even if people are, in the end of the day, maybe just chemical compounds, they're so complicated that it's beyond hope to quantify them properly. And you can still go and ask experienced software developers who've worked in a lot of projects and um, who know how to do things well. But still, even if you get the most experienced ones, they maybe have worked in 10 or 15 or let it even be 20 projects, 20 large projects in their lifetime, but that's still significantly, significantly, um, statistically most insignificant when you compare that to pharmaceutical tests. And that is exactly where our code phase projects comes in. So basically, we want to understand software, software development, open source software, and the embedded ecosystem by using methods that have proven success, proven to be successful in many other um, aspects of engineering. So in a nutshell, code phase is about two aspects. First of all, we needed to do some fundamental research, and we are still doing this fundamental research because software development is not yet understood to a level where we really can say we can solve these problems satisfactorily. So I'm going to talk a little about this fundamental research, but we are also very keen on really providing practical help to people and producing practical software that allows to analyze open source projects, that allows you to understand these projects and what's going on in these projects, and I'll also introduce this piece of software that we have developed and Needless to say, um, we've published it as open source software. So it automatically needs to be good, because as you know, open source software is always good. Good, what are, what are our objectives? Um, to briefly summarize that, we want to learn from software development data. So we want to look at a project, and we want to be able to see what's good about this project, what's objectively good about this project, what's a property that's desirable to copy, and we want to do that in the best possible objective way. We want to understand the network effects that come 
with open source software development, and we want to understand them quantitatively, which implies that we need to quantify in some way or another the social factors that come with software development, and we do that by mining large bodies of software and quite obviously open source software where all the data are available in public um, is a very good field um, to do this work. We're not just doing that for the understanding of the software, we want to provide actionable insi um, insights, not insults. We want to provide actionable insights, so we want you to be able to pick, if you have a given software development scenario using our results, the most efficient approach to your project. We want you to be able, if you're running own projects, to assess your ongoing development if it's good in certain respects or if you could do better in other aspects. And we want you to make, be able to make informed choices when it comes um, to setting up software projects and to evaluating software projects. What is not our intention is we want to impose any mandatory interpretations on software projects. So we're surely not going to say, hey, the Linux kernel is the only software project that is run in a meaningful way, in a sensible way, so you all should act like in the Linux kernel, or you all should act in QMU. That is not our intention. We will leave you all the freedom there is, but we will give you the um, possibility to compare your efforts to, um, to efforts that are known to be good or bad. So, uh, in order for this to work, we require um, a lot of data and we'd like to get hold on all the data that there is. So, what are our data sources? Um, quite obviously, the internet. Actually, then I show this slide in Europe. People tend to be amused about it, but maybe you're more uh, used to the NSA providing a collection service for all the data <laughs> you can get in the United States. I wish. We had their storage capacities, we unfortunately don't have, but we're trying to approximate um, this data collection building to the best possible extent that we can. And we do that by mining essentially four types of information sources. That is above all revision control systems that carry all the um, information about how development of a project goes. That is mailing lists which are very conveniently available in open source software because people do most of their discussions online and so we have means of tracking these discussions, analyzing these discussions. We also mine bug tracking software to see where the de or how many defects go into products, how fast these are fixed, who works on fixing them, if this is at all correlated with, with what people speak on mailing lists and so on. And finally, we do also care about code complexity measurements um, to bring the uh, technological aspect of software development into the picture, which is done um, using some third-party tools and I'm not going to elaborate much in this talk, so I'm going to focus on revision control, bug tracking, and mailing lists. So what kind of, uh, what types of information do we infer? Let me give you some examples. And the uh, classical thing that you analyze in software project is how much progress in, is made over time that's a thing that has been done, for instance, for the Linux kernel by the Linux Foundation for quite a while. And you see time series like that. That's for the um, Linux kernel, uh, which we've tracked for a number of years, starting about in 2009 and going to 2013, 2014, to contemporary days. And I suppose you've all seen graphs of this kind from the Linux Foundation. So the red bars indicate when a release is cut, the blue shaded areas indicate the... Um, stabilization phases and the actual development really only happens during these gray phases. Um, you, know, you all know that the Linux kernel is a very disciplined project, so it's sort of a role model for open source software. Code really only goes in, new code really only goes in when it's supposed to go in and then during the stabilization phase that you see here, people spend all their efforts on fixing bugs and not introducing new bugs via new code, which is a very good approach to software engineering in most people's opinion. Um, when you compare that to other open source projects, you may see a not so regular behavior. For instance, take Ruby on Rails. Um, you see the project has a slightly different approach to software engineering. Essentially, they seem to cut releases whenever they see fit. Um, they sometimes do stabilization phases, they sometimes don't. Code uh, goes into the project, new code goes into the project irregardless 
uh, of if there's a stabilization phase or not. And so surely it's debatable if this is an approach to engineering that's as good as the Linux kernel ones. But as I said, we don't want to impose any mandatory interpretations with our software. We just like to analyze what's here. But irregardless of which approach you choose, what I guess we can all agree on this is that a project should be self-consistent. So it should be reliable in producing its releases uh, in its engineering approach. Because when you deploy a project in a product and you say, okay, I've taken this and that release, you want to be sure that there won't be a stream of patches flowing in right after um, the release was cut because then you don't need to yeah, bring updates for your products or do last minute pre-release maintenance changes for your product. So it's self-consistency that's more important than the approach and that is one aspect that we do measure with Codeface. We can do that for code coming into the project, we can do that for bugs, we can do that for all aspects, but I'm just focusing on um, code that flows into the project for now to be brief. What we do is um, we take the time series and compute how self-consistent are they. So we take one release cycle, we take the next release cycle and we look into how similar are these release cycles. We start going and we do that for all release cycles that happened in a project. Um, without going into any details how we do that, so it's basically a standard statistical problems, a problem in time series processing, we can arrive at a number that indicates the similarity between two consecutive release cycles and I've plotted the distribution of these similarities for pre free projects here, so Linux, Clang, and QMU. So that's the median value. This is the, basically the range how the values are distributed in um, the most likely cases, and these are extremal points. So if you just look at the data, that doesn't tell very much. You see that Linux has a similarity of about 0 0.05, so the smaller the number, the more similar are consecutive release cycles, and that it goes as high as 0 0.15, 0 0.18. That doesn't tell you much, but um, it becomes meaningful when you compare it to other projects. So take Clang, take QMU. You see that Clang is similarly rigid in preparing its releases, as is the Linux kernel. It even has a slightly, slower, a slightly lower variation, so it's on the same page with engineering and the same for QMU. You know that QMU was taken over mostly by kernel developers, so it's no surprise to see that there are similar uh, effects in cutting releases. When we compare that to projects that are less strict about their engineering, that's for one Twitter bootstrap, and the OpenSSL project, and you know that the OpenSSL project may have had a problem or two in the recent past, and when you look at this figure, you actually can see that this happened before, because they have a very, both projects have a very wide range of similarities in their development cycles, which means of their release cycles, which means that they just sometimes do cut releases immediately after another release, or that lots of code flows into uh, the source-based steering phase that's supposed to be stabilization and so on. And without any reference to these actual projects and to their actual, um, to the actual behavior, you can see from this graph that they're very much less strict than these three role model projects, Linux, QMU, and Clang. Good, the second thing that we can analyze goes a little beyond just measuring technological process. It's about examining communication. Because I said in the beginning, software development is a lot about people and people interact mostly not by writing code, but by talking to each other. So we analyze the content of mailing lists when we want to get an impression of how a project is doing in this area. And here's an example for the Clang compiler. So basically what we do is we take all messages that are exchanged during the development of a certain um, release cycle. We analyze who wrote a message, who spoke to whom, and uh, we analyze the topic that the people um, conversed about. Uh, that's quite a problem. You have to go into great linguistical depths to do this type of analysis and then you arrive at graphs like this. So in a nutshell you see the different contributors, the larger 
the name is the more central our method has evaluated them to be for the project. So for Klein, that it would be, for instance, James Molloy, uh, John McCall, Ellie Friedman, and so on. So if you're um, involved in the project, you know that these are central guys. And you see that they've um, talked about the usual topics in building compilers like metadata, LLVM, like fixing bugs, warning and errors in outputs, header files, analyzing code, and so on. So we can see not only who's speaking, but also what topics they're speaking about. And if that's not pure NSA, I don't know what is. Uh, we can do the same thing for Git, and you get, you get the idea. So Rinio Hamano is the maintainer of this project, and we've correctly identified him as the most central person, and he speaks to many, many people yeah, of lesser importance about a whole load of topics. Actually, um, when we first did this analysis, we put a lot of hope into analyzing the content of discussions, but it turned out that the topics we've detected that people speak about is interesting in a linguistic sense because extracting these topics from email exchanges is quite an involved problem, as you can think, but you simply don't get any surprises. It's no surprise that Git people talk about revisions, that they talk about a base, rebasing, merging, and so on, and it's no surprise that compiler people talk about syntactic analysis, code generation, and so on. So the topics are actually much less interesting than we thought they would be, but and they are, they are hard to evaluate by machines. So that's the second point that's uh, not to our advantage. But what we found out is that the overall picture of communication is quite meaningful. So going back to these two different projects, you see that the structure is entirely different. You have a number of central people in the Clang compiler that are assisted by a lot of yeah, contributors on a, ver on a very varying range of topics, and you see that Git does it completely different. You have one central person who basically is in charge of, um, of participating in all discussions, and he's surrounded by a lot of people that are not even remotely as important to the project as this central guy is. Um, so we had to find a representation to capture this aspect of communication more concisely, and that's shown in these diagrams. So actually, we're, we're not interested in the names of the people and in the topics they're speaking about. They're good for calibrating our results, because if we know a project well, we know what people are involved, and we can see if the results that we derive are meaningful or not, but in the end of the day, we want a representation like this. And that diagram shows basically on um, the x-axis how much a given person contributes to um, discussion. So if he discusses a lot, he's here. If he, he discusses, he or she discusses only little, he's here. And the y-axis gives the relative importance of the person to the project. So if he's a great expert or just someone who makes a lot of noise without much effect. And you immediately see from these two diagrams, please just focus on the uh, top part of the diagrams, I'll come to that in a minute, that the social structure of these two projects is totally different. We have a lot of crucial experts in the Clang project. We have a lot of people who contribute to discussions but are not so much experts themselves. They tend to be more the users. But overall, there's a fairly large amount of people who are really actively involved in the project and are driving conversations. Whereas for the case of Git, you see you have this one isolated super expert who is involved in every single discussion, who has a lot of influence on the project, but he's quite alone. And you have a lot of people who participate in discussions, but who don't have much influence on the outcome of these discussions. And actually, that's if you go to a commercial setting, that's a project setup that you want, because you want your project to be robust and stable against say, personal changes. If one of these experts leaves the project, it will still continue to run as is. But say, if Junio um, Hamano happens to be run over by a bus, then it's very likely that the Git project will run into one sort of trouble or another. It's a similar situation that we had with the Linux kernel a while ago when Linux, uh, when, when, when Linus was this very one crucial person and if he had been run over by a bus at this stage of the project, we very likely 
would not be seeing Linux in the way as we do it now. So why am I showing two diagrams here for each project that look very similar? That's for the reason because we're analyzing both the email subjects and the content of the discussion. And you see that both diagrams are very similar. So it turns out that you don't need to really dig into the actual content of the discussion to arrive at some conclusions about the social structure of a project. It really just suffices to look at the subject, which was surprising to us. But then we asked some linguistics people, and they told us, hey, this has been known for a long, long, long while. It doesn't really matter what people speak about. Uh, you can derive everything from the headlines, which may be worrying or maybe reassuring, depending on how you see that. Good. Um, I mentioned that we want to compare projects, and you've seen that Clang and Git are really different uh, projects in that aspect. So let me come to two more examples. One, uh, yeah, so content doesn't matter, subject suffice. Let me come to two more examples. One is the Apache, HTTPD, so the uh, web server. And what really astonished us about this project is you have, for such a crucial piece of infrastructure on the internet, you have very few people, it's about 20 people per development cycle, actually joining in the discussions, and you have a, a picture that's similar to Git, so you have a few central experts, and, but mostly yeah, not, not so influential developers, which can be a bit worrisome, considering that the very same picture emerges for OpenSSL, but in a slightly more extreme manner. You have this one crucial expert, and you have a lot of people who maybe are a bit knowledgeable about the project, but who don't, influence it, who don't influence it very much. So if you compare these two graphs, Apache and OpenSSL, you find some worrying similarities. Just a second. And if you consider the trouble OpenSSL had in recent times, um, you may be worried for the Apache HTTPD server as well, for sure. So you have a question? Yeah, the scales, the scales are changing indeed. They're changing quite a lot. So the volume on the Apache mailing list is in general much higher than the volume in uh, terms of messages that people talk about than it is for um, Apache. So you have even less communication going on for Apache than for OpenSSL, but we actually found that not the numbers or that the numbers are only a secondary thing. It's mostly the shape of, of the distribution of uh, the dots that count. Okay. Good. So let me come to another example that's cooperation and teams, this time not seen from the uh, communication point of view, but from the technological uh, cooperation. Actually, when, when you go to the Siemens image database, you find a lot of nice images that uh, visualize how life is at Siemens, and that is how our marketing people imagine working together to be, although I can tell you I've never seen a red sofa that is so nice in the whole life at Siemens, and I've also never seen an engineer dressed like this at work. But regardless of that, what's very popular when you consider the um, cooperation in software projects is you take the revision control systems, you see who cooperates with whom, and then you draw one huge cooperation diagram. You arrive at quite amazing results for the Linux kernel. We all know that uh, quite a large number of people contributes per development cycle, like 1,000 people or 500 people, lots of, and then you arrive at these huge, completely meaningless diagrams because they essentially tell you that people do cooperate in one way or another. When you go to the scientific literature, you find great improvement. Then the diagrams look like this. So they filter they manage to filter out some contributors, but still arrive at diagrams that you can conclude from there are people and they um, cooperate in one way or another. So what you actually want is you want to decompose these graphs further. You want to find the communities that a project is composed of. And we have um, derived or invented means of doing that for software development. And let me show you that um, for the... QMU project. So you see we've identified yeah, roughly five larger sub-communities of the project 
uh, that cooperate closely. And nowadays, QMU has, in our opinion, a very sane structure. So you have a few central maintainers or central contributors indicated by dot size in each of these communities. And you have a, a reasonable number of people contributing to each community. Actually, the number of people in each community is much larger than these um, seven plus minus two people um, that are always quoted by the HL community as the optimal size of a team. So open source software proves, I guess, that teams can be much larger. And this is more in sync with common sense than the seven plus minus two people thing. But that's just a side remark. So um, irregardless of that, we are interested when we look at cooperation in basically two things. That's the influence of individual com contributors. So you want central people who are responsible for a given portion of the code, that's a good thing, but you also want the same group structure. So you want to avoid communities saying like this as good as possible if there's a, in which there's only one single central uh, responsible guy because if he drops off, the community is likely to have a problem, so you want a structure like this. And actually when, when you consider, so we can, all, we can do that in a time-resolved manner, and when you consider the QMU project, it started out mostly as a hobbyist thing, by some developers, and then was taken over by kernel developers after people realized that it's a crucial ingredient in virtualization nowadays, so it's um, both a crucial component for Xen and for uh, KVM. So people take a lot of care about the project, and that's why we arrived at the same community structure. In the earlier days, that used to be completely different. So in the beginning, essentially, you just had one community like this, a single bubble in the middle, and that was it. It was Fabrice Bellard who started the project. Then people picked up contributing to the project, but um, essentially you still had two or three central people, central persons, who did all the maintenance, who had to deal with contributions from a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, individual developers. Naturally, that does not scale very well. That's something you want to avoid. And then by some unorganized or organized process, we don't know why that comes about, but it seems a universal feature of open source software that when projects become more professional, you arrive at structures like these with moderately sized groups with a few central maintainers and um, yeah, in this scalable structure. Good. Um, how do you construct such networks or such, such um, community evaluations? Actually, it's a three-step process, so you need to construct your base input network. So this network here, that's the first thing to do. You need to determine computer um, contributor centrality, so you need to determine how influential an individual contributor is. That's the dot size, and finally, you need to identify meaningful subgroups. And that's a very interesting mathematical problem and a very interesting problem of machine learning. So I'm not um, going into too many details. Let me just remark three things. The um, network construction we actually do from revision control systems. And we have three means of doing that. We can either rely on the uh, tagging mechanism provided by projects like the Linux kernel or QMU. Where people sign off patches or acknowledge patches and by that create an explicit social um, network among developers. That's the easiest thing. We can use, if a project doesn't provide this type of information, we can use committer author relations. Most um, modern revision control systems nowadays distinguish between the roles of committer and the role of author. And you have an implicit relationship, social relationship between the committer and the author. Um, and it actually turns out that using this committer author information is nearly as good as using the tagging information. Finally, if we run into projects with a really old structure that do not distinguish between committers and authors or that use automated bots, then we still can see um, who contributed to overlapping sections of code, say one function that you jointly contributed to, and assume that this implies at least some implicit um, type of social interaction. That's the least... Um, the least successful approach, but it still gives you um, some idea how people work together. But these two approaches have shown to be uh, quite reliable. And actually, I come to verification how we verify these results later on. So for um, contributor centrality, actually, we didn't need to in 
invent anything new. You're just using Google's page rank. You all know the idea. When you have a web page that links or that is linked to the many other web pages, the web page itself becomes more important. And when this web page links to another web page, this web page automatically inherits some of the importance. And we do the same thing for developers. So if one developer gets patches signed off or acknowledged or tagged by many other developers, we assume that he's a, he or she is a crucial, crucial important guy, a central guy, and that when he signs off a patch, this patch somewhat inherits his importance, or respectively the author of the patch somewhat inherits his importance. That's a self-consistent um, a self-consistent approach, and you can compute um, yeah, everything that's needed in the end of the day by using standard means. So that means we've arrived at a uh, contributor network, and we've arrived with assigning importance, relative importance to developers. So the only thing that's left to be done is to decompose the networks into subgroups. And that's the hardest aspect of the problem, so we've spent a lot of time researching for the best methods to do this community detection. And in the end of the day, it turned out that a so-called spin glass approach that happens to come from quantum mechanics. So if you say quantum mechanics, then people are always impressed because it automatically works. Quantum mechanics is all magic, as you know. And so I'm not going to get into the details any further. I've left some details on the slides that you may want to read up if you're interested in the details. But just suffice it to say that spin glasses, um, and when I prepared the talk, I, I realized that you can actually buy spinning glasses in the real world. So the spin glass approach is turned out to be the best approach for our problem. Good. Software development is about people, and people work a lot on trust. So we've developed a software to decompose um, cooperation diagrams into subcommunities. Why would you trust us? And actually, we're, we thought about this problem very hard, why we should trust our own results, and we do this in two ways, or, or in three ways. So um, thing number one is we have some expert knowledge about the projects we're analyzing, so many of us have been involved in open source software in the Linux kernel for quite a while. And I said we are usually not interested in names of developers, but just in structures. But when it comes to evaluating, validating our results, we are actually interested in the names because when we look at communities, we then can see does this community make sense or not so. For instance, this community here has a guy called Avi Kiviti um, in a very central place and another guy called Bajelo Tosati in a very central place, and developers like Gleb Napatov, um, Jan Kiska, Alexander Graf, Michael Sorkin, and so on, um, in this community. And when you've been involved with Linux kernel development, you immediately see that this is the subgroup responsible for producing the KVM hypervisor. And actually, it turns out that we can assign meaning in this way to most of the communities that we detect without any a priori knowledge of the projects we're analyzing. So our computer and our algorithms have no idea about KVM, but still they find the KVM communities in the next kernel development and did that reliably for quite a number of development cycles. So this type of information, or this, this um, community-based information is very important when you reason about projects in a more or less automatic manner, because if you don't pay attention to uh, these finer points. If you just look at the numbers, you arrive at many of the results, like this famous one, who, make, who helps make Linux. Microsoft that went through the press during the development of kernel 3.0 because the Linux Foundation actually publishes a report and on who's contributing to the Linux kernel. And for this development cycle, it turns out that some guy, um, K.Y. Srini Vazan, was actually the most important developer to, um, contributor to the Linux kernel in terms of patches, in terms of amount of code that he contributed. He works for Microsoft. He works on their um, embedded hypervisors. So the popular press took these numbers and said, yeah, cool, now Microsoft is taking over the Linux kernel, which is a completely nonsensical statement. They surely don't. And their influence in the kernel, as most kernel 
developers would agree is very limited, but still, if you just look at the numbers, it would appear to be that way. Now, using our approach, people could have gotten a much more realistic picture because if you look at the community that this Microsoft guy is involved with, you see he's right here, and this is a very large community, sub-community. And if you look at the central person in this community, you see, you may not be able to read that, but trust me, it's Greg Crow hartman that our methods have determined to be the responsible guy in this community. And when you look at it, you realize that this is the uh, yeah, staging device driver tree. So Microsoft has contributed a lot of code. It's indicated by this large arrow to the staging device driver tree, so um, device driver subsystems or subsystem, where code of suboptimal quality goes in and the developer is right at yeah, the brink of this community. So if you look at this picture, as compared to these numbers, you surely wouldn't arrive at the conclusion that Microsoft is any central contributor to the Linux kernel. So people are surely not just a collection of numbers, but in some aspects they can be approximated by a collection of numbers, giving a large enough interpretational context. At least that's what we believe. Good. So um, if we say we evaluated that using our expert knowledge, you can still doubt our expert knowledge or the expert knowledge of the people who were involved. That's why we came up with a second scheme, namely to use statistics to check the quality of our decompositions. And um, without, without going into many details, let me just say um, that what we are doing is we want, um, we say, yeah, we have this given decomposition, and then to ask if it's meaningful or not, we ask the statistical question, how likely would it have been that if we had applied any random decomposition scheme to our large network, how likely is it that we would have arrived at this conclusion? If it's very likely, then we are very likely dealing with a um, just random effect. If it's highly unlikely, then statistics says you um, with some probability of something meaningful. So if any one of you is into statistics, then he or she knows I'm leaving out many of the fine points of statistics, but that's basically how it goes. We compare the likelihood of our results compared to a random approach, and if it turns out it's highly unlikely that this stems from a random decomposition, then the communities that we have detected are likely meaningful. Actually, you can study all the maths. Um, I was so tempted to do that, but I'm not going to do that as part of this talk. So that's all for formulas in this talk now. Let me just show you one more picture um, for a, say, that's the, um, I think the Apache HTTP web server. And you see, we can, using our approach, really determine the central contributors. We can say this, 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 and that community makes sense. But we can also say that some communities, like this community number three, don't make sense, that's just an invariant, um, a side effect that you cannot avoid, but at least we can be so honest as to say, hey, we detected something, but we are not quite sure that it makes sense, and we tell you that. Actually, when, when you think about software engineering, the alternative approach to going into such great mathematical depths is to ask the HR people, and then you will invariably get the response, so, hey, how do I organize my development teams? And the HR people always say, yeah, Ken Schwaber says a team has seven plus minus two people. Everything else just does not work full stop. And I hope that you all agree with us that it's worth all the mathematics to arrive at more fine-grained and um, statistically-backed conclusions than at such simple statements. Good. The third thing that we do about evaluating our results is actually we ask you, we ask the experts. So we have a survey where we present you with the results that we've evaluated for the projects that you may be working with. And if you are a contributor to any of these projects mentioned here, so all the or many of the high-profile open source projects, we are much interested in hearing your opinion on our decompositions to validate the results that we have derived. So if you're interested in helping us, please either see us um, or see me at the Codeface booth or talk to me and then I'll present you with some um, 
server form to fill in. That should take like five minutes, but will give you eternal gratefulness from the scientific community. So, um, summing up, um, it's, the project is not just about establishing new methods to analyze and to understand open source software, but it's also about a very specific software project that gives you access to all the data and to all the conclusions that we have derived. And so we've spent quite some effort on designing a web front end that people can use to analyze their own projects and um, to compare them to other approaches. So basically, this is how the web front end looks like. You get this management style summary for a given project, and it provides these traffic style, traffic light type um, summaries that managers like so much. So for the QMU project, you see that everything goes well in terms of construction, in terms of collaboration, in terms of communication. For this instance, we haven't run a complexity analysis, but we are also so honest to say that. Um, and then you successful, successively can dig deeper into why we've arrived at these conclusions. So we don't say it's just good, but we also tell you why we think it's good. So here's an example for the construction of a J query project, a project which we think is troublesome for some reason. So you see that by the orange color. And if you really want to understand why it's troublesome, you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper until you really arrive at the raw data they will need to invest a minute or two to understand how we arrive at this data and why this is bad. But as I said in the beginning, we don't impose any mandatory interpretations on you. We provide suggestions, uh, but leave the interpretation and the reasoning really to you. Good. You can also customize the web front end for your own purposes if you say collaboration is mostly about the uh, people who produce lots of commits in this box, and people who have, persons who have a large page rank, who have a large influence in the project, you can configure the web front end dynamically on a per user basis like this. You could also say I'm more interested in the clustering structure of my project when it comes to collaboration, but still want to keep an eye on the commits, and I want to keep an eye on how much that shows how much load is placed on individual maintainers or individual contributors in the project, you're free to configure the system as you like to drill into the aspects of the project that are of interest to you. Good. Um, finally, let me mention that this um, web front end and the whole system is, yeah, is available as open source software, so you can get it from our GitHub repository. I have to admit that installing the thing is still a bit of a painful experience. This painful experience comes from the fact um, that we really couldn't stop, or that we really couldn't agree on one single technology to implement the project with. And so we've ended up with a whole bunch of very different but very interesting technologies that range from GNU R to um, HTML5 to Git to C++ to LaTeX uh, to Python and so on. And when you try to bundle all that into a single consistent package that just didn't work. So expect that you need to spend maybe two hours or more to get our project up and running. We're still working on that, but right now it's a bit painful, but you will be rewarded with a playground where you can work on many uh, topics ranging from parsing unstructured data to a dynamic reactive web front end written in a combination of R and HTML5. And also you can play with lots of techniques that you ever wanted to get involved with, ranging from computer science to physics to um, linguistics and statistics. So contributions are welcome. You're also most welcome to join, to participate in our survey, to help uh, validating or refuting our results. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest. Are there any questions? Oh, lots of, yeah, so. Uh, you mentioned code quality in terms of the release cycle and the activity there, right? Can you go a little deeper and maybe a little bit of tracking or uh, something that I'm going to be asked about is that none of this, you know, it's not necessarily improving. 
so basically what I've shown you in terms of co-quality is just the surface, so the, the time series, that's the most elementary thing. We do a quite involved analysis in terms of measuring code complexity, so basically can provide all the uh, measures ranging from cyclomatic complexity to cohesion to whatnot in a time-resolved manner, and we can see um, if complexity in a certain subgroup, in a certain submodule, rises, falls, stays the same, we can compare that to, say, the amount of code that goes into a subsystem, and then we can decide, hey, the code amount stays the same, the complexity goes up, so we'd likely evaluate that as something that is a dangerous trend in your project. When I think about Git, maybe I'm a little bit naive, but I use my five favorite Git commands. I didn't know they were actually like actively doing a bunch of shit. So when there's one key person on Git, it seems like maybe that's okay as a mature project. Um, so I didn't see any of your analysis that talked about the maturity of a project and how that affects what the you know, various diagrams of what you So actually, the question was. If there's a mature project, it may be completely okay to have one single central contributor, as in Git, because the project is fine. And the answer is yes, that may be completely fine. So we do not, um, when, we, when we compute these um, overall evaluations of a project, we do not look for is there only one single person who drives all the project. That's not a reason for getting a negative score. But what we look, do look into is... Um, how does the group with this one single contributor compare to other groups? So is the code uptake slower? Is the defect rate, for instance, that they are, um, are seeing from bug tracking systems, is it larger than or higher than in comparable projects and so on? But um, yeah, we don't, we don't place any mandatory interpretations that may be completely fine, but we try to set it in context as good as possible. And if there's anything troublesome we detect this way, then we give you a warning. Uh, have you looked at uh, how these structures might evolve over the time as, as, a, <coughs> as a project of the being or you see if there are patterns that were structures that are more stable or less stable? Mm -hmm. So the question was, did we look at um, the covariates that we analyze um, over time, and the answer is yes. So everything that we do is based on a time series analysis. We never take the global state of a project. We compute all um, the pieces of information just for release cycles, and we have time series for everything. We have time series for changing community structures. We have time series for changing complexity structures, and so on. And there are some... Um, there are some patterns that emerge that we do see. However, we have not been able yet to fully formulate any hypothesis on if there are like um, common, um, common types of propagation in open source projects that we uni universally observe. We have some, um, some common sense interpretations and we have some ideas on what these might be, but we haven't been able to formalize that yet. Have you looked at the influence of funding on the projects? Uh, and the kernel subsystem has been entering a dramatic shift several years ago when the companies started funding it with uh, uh, The big shift from hobbyists for the most part to professionals and people who escape from Actually, we've only done that implicitly, so we've seen these effects, for instance, for QEMU. As I mentioned, we've seen that in the early days when we knew that QMU was a hobbyist project, we've seen a completely different social interaction structure than in the days when it was taken over by professional paid developers. But unfortunately, we cannot or we are not yet able to quantify that because we simply lack a data source that says, hey, they got this and this and this and that funding that we can access. Maybe the NSA could help us there, but we don't have anything um, that's universally available for the projects that we could analyze. But it would be very interesting. Um, some projects, uh, like Firefox, for example, will have a bunch of people who contribute but do not contribute code. So they do utilization or do design or do user research. Um, have you given any thought on how to capture those contributions? 
So the question was, projects like Firefox have lots of contributors who don't contribute actual code, but work with the project in one way or another. And that's, we've, we've considering that very much, that's precisely the reason why we do not just analyze um, source code repositories, but also bug trackers and most importantly, mailing lists, because we intend to capture these effects that way. What we would like to add in the future is to do some comparisons between the social, social structures that we derive from mailing lists with the social structures that we derive from, app, from other types of um, data sources. Um, that would be doable, but we haven't done that yet. On this uh, Yeah, they are available from our, most all the examples that I've shown are available from the Codeface website. I will be making my slides available. And we are currently working on making a, an instance of the web front end publicly available, but we're still struggling with some legal issues, so it's not so, <laughs> so easy to provide services from within Siemens to the evil outside intranet. And we also have some um, technological issues about hosting and so on, but I hope that we'll get there anytime soon. Yes? How about a, a medium filter so you can set through time and see how the project evolves? So that you see the graph at this, this stage. Actually, you, you can do that with the web front. And so we've organized the display into widgets. So it's very easy to write uh, custom visualizations, and it's an object-oriented widgeting system. And basically, you just, um, you just derive your widget from a time series base class widget, and then you automatically, as you see here, you get the possibility to step through all releases in time automatically without you having to care about that. Okay, so um, Tim is signaling me time's over, so let me thank you again for your interest and enjoy the rest of the conference.